section fifteen of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eight empire and papacy fourteen fourteen to fourteen fifty three part one the little town of constance saw many a strange and impressive sight toward the close of the year fourteen fourteen ever since june preparations had been in progress for the reception of the greatest council the middle ages had ever known fourteen fourteen through fourteen eighteen toward the close of the year princes and prelates nobles and merchants with a mass of lesser people of all nations and all professions flocked into the place the hill roads shone with many-coloured processions and the lake was gay with boats conveying great men and their followers not only those taking part in affairs came to the council constance became the scene of an ecclesiastical conference a political congress and a great world fair amusements of all sorts were held in the streets festivities tournaments and banquets lightened the graver business of the meeting and an idle multitude found in it an occasion for diversion and money-making the council was a great epoch in the history of the church meetings had often been held before this to treat of ecclesiastical matters popes had summoned prelates to advise and consult at pisa cardinals had met to discuss the claims of rival pontiffs but constance was something more than these a general council was now asserting power to settle the claims of three rival popes without adhering to the side of any it was declaring itself superior to the papacy and was taking into its own hands the reform of the church three great questions were before this vast assemblage first and foremost there was the settlement of the papal schism for unity must be restored in divided christendom secondly the whole church the papacy itself the lives of the clergy the discipline of the monasteries all were in need of the most stringent reform and finally the new doctrines which were disturbing the minds of men of which the chief teacher was john huss disciple of the english wycliffe must be rooted out and all heretical ideas suppressed once and for ever such a programme accompanied as it was by many points of minor importance would provide work for several years to come among the great processions which were welcomed to constance three above all others excited universal interest toward the close of october came pope john the twenty third making his way through the snow surrounded by his cardinals and protected by frederick of Habsburg, the greatest prince and landowner in that region on christmas day the emperor sigismund arrived travelling before daybreak that he might be in time for the solemn mass at which he himself read the gospel beginning with the appropriate words there went out a decree from caesar augustus the sermon delivered on this occasion by peter d'ailly must have been uncomfortable hearing for the proud pope john who was still hoping to maintain his position the text taken was there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars the sun said the preacher represented the pope the moon the emperor and the stars the cardinals but unjust ambitions evil deeds and negligent rule would make but a phantom of the sun and again the holy trinity of the divine person is not more adorable than a trinity of popes is abominable and he also stated in clear words that the council's power was superior to that of the pope between these two arrivals a much more humble procession found its way into the town which nevertheless met with almost as hearty a reception for crowds flocked in to meet the thin bearded man in his simple black robes who was escorted by three bohemian nobles responsible for his safety john huss under a promise of safety from the emperor had come to constance to maintain his views before the assembly of christendom and to clear himself from the charge of heresy 
his safe conduct was of little avail for shortly after his arrival he was taken from his house despite the vehement protestations of one of the attendant nobles and after a questioning before pope and cardinals flung into a loathsome prison which nearly caused his death and it was only to save him for further humiliation that the conditions of his captivity were lightened for the time meanwhile the position of pope john was far from reassuring although still nominally the head of the council a murmur ever growing more and more insistent was making itself heard in favour of his abdication cardinal d'ailly went so far as to declare that the council had full power to force him to resign then followed an appalling statement probably all too true of the many misdeeds of the pope whose life had been notoriously wicked fearful lest this private accusation should be published to the world john consented to abdicate and in clear terms and with a calm demeanour he himself read before the emperor and assembled cardinals a promise to resign his power on the day that benedict the thirteenth and gregory the twelfth should do the same there was general rejoicing sigismund impulsive and theatrical threw himself uncrowned at the feet of the pope and kissed them gratefully a proposal for the election of a successor followed at once doubtless john hoped to obtain his own re-election but his character was too well known for that the english representative at the council robert hallam bishop of salisbury exclaimed that the pope deserved to be burnt at the stake hopeless of swaying the council john determined to leave constance and see what could be done elsewhere a request to leave on account of his health having been refused he contrived his own escape the opportunity came when a great tournament was being held to which all the inhabitants of the town flocked leaving the streets deserted the pope in the humble disguise of a groom rode out of the town unnoticed and taking boat on the rhine reached schaffhausen the castle of his friend frederick of austria who had been privy to his flight terror and disorder were left behind him some thought that the council was thereby dissolved many feared the curse which he might lay upon the city but others were ready to take advantage of the occasion the emperor denounced the austrian duke as a traitor and gershon councillor of the assembly proclaimed the council to be the supreme and independent authority of christendom a short while after the formal deposition of john the twenty third fourteen fifteen was pronounced by the council and the once powerful pope after vain attempts to evade his pursuers was captured and imprisoned first at gottleben just outside constance and finally in the castle of heidelberg when fully humiliated and no longer dangerous he was released and made a cardinal but his death followed immediately after meanwhile john hus had been awaiting his trial also a prisoner at gottleben for some time past bohemia had been the centre of new ideas the whole authority of the church had been shaken by the dissensions in the papacy and the impossibility of respecting the head of the spiritual world whilst all through the church had spread the disastrous effects of weakness at the centre abuses of all sorts were common the clergy were rich and neglected their duty they held so many posts that they could not possibly fill them all satisfactorily people and parishes were neglected and suffering in england during the previous century john wycliffe had boldly denounced the sins of the church had struck at the whole system of ecclesiastical government declared that the authority of the pope was not only excessive but unnecessary and attacked some of the doctrines of the church especially transubstantiation and prayers to saints the writings of wycliffe introduced into bohemia had great influence and were eagerly studied at the university of prague where hus had done much to make them known in some matters hus did not go as far as the english teacher particularly in the question of transubstantiation but he also urged reformation of abuses and superstitions and especially denounced the sale of indulgences commanded by the pope he also wrote 
that christ himself was the head of the church and the scriptures the basis of belief there was plenty of material here for a condemnation and from the first despite sigismund's worthless safe conduct his fate was already decided nevertheless his trial dragged on for many a long day and hus promised to withdraw his own opinions should the cardinals be able to disprove them but in total absence of proof he held his own without a waver and refused firmly though modestly to condemn wycliffe's teaching or to disown his own writings even here hus was not without supporters his friend and disciple jerome of prague followed him to constance only to be flung into prison on one occasion john of clum a bohemian noble boldly proclaimed in my castle i would have defended him for a year against all the forces of emperor or king how much more lords mightier than i with castles far more impregnable sigismund basely deserted him perhaps it was a hard choice between giving up the man he had promised to protect and seeing the council which he had done so much to collect and from which he hoped such great things fall to pieces its work half done in any case his conduct was despicable even in his own eyes and when hus said freely i came hither under the safe conduct of the emperor sigismund is said to have blushed deeply his attitude was now however decided enough declaring that he had only promised to protect him so that he might answer his enemy's charges and that he could not defend a heretic he went on to say far from defending you in your errors and in your contumacy i will be the first to light the fire with my own hands on another occasion the emperor urged that not only hus but all his followers should be condemned and the whole sect exterminated root and branch on the sixth of july fourteen fifteen sentence was finally pronounced in the cathedral of constance sigismund sat on the throne with princes and cardinals round him and the proceedings opened with mass during which hus as a heretic stood in the porch then followed the reading and condemnation of certain articles said to contain the doctrines of wycliffe and hus in vain he endeavoured to protest that some of the accusations were totally false after that came the degradation one by one his priestly robes were taken from him and his tonsure obliterated whilst on his head was placed a tall cap of paper covered with painted devils judgment was then pronounced the church has no more to do with you we deliver your body to the secular arm your soul to the devils in hell the secular judge pronounced the final sentence of death by burning as a heretic and hus went calm and unmoved singing and praying to his doom sixth of july fourteen fifteen we know not said those who stood near what this man may have done we only know that his prayers to god are excellent his ashes were flung into the lake and his clothes destroyed that no relics might be treasured up by his sorrowing disciples but the uselessness of such measures to efface his influence was soon to be shown the martyrdom of hus was followed by that of jerome of prague who as we have seen had followed his master to constance and to captivity he was treated with so much cruelty in his prison that in sheer bodily weakness he gave way at his first examination and denied the doctrines of wycliffe and hus soon however he regained his strength and with admirable courage deliberately destroyed all hope of escape he proclaimed his faith with an eloquence and shrewdness and a clear-headedness perfectly marvellous after a year passed in severe confinement there was to be no doubt now as to his attitude this sinful retractation i now fully retract and i am resolved to maintain the tenets of wycliffe and of john hus to death believing them to be the true and pure doctrine of the gospel even as their lives were blameless and holy like hus he went calmly to the stake fourteen sixteen and when the executioner turned to light the heaped-up pile at his back he called to him kindle it before my eyes had i feared your fire i should never have come to this place he sang hymns with a steady voice until the flames leaped up around him 
much still remained for the council to do the papal question was not yet solved john was deposed gregory the twelfth had submitted and died benedict still remained obstinate he refused to come in person to defend his claims before the council unless he should be received as pope he declared that any acts of reform decreed at constance should be null and void and disregarding his formal deposition he established himself in peniscula in spain and kept up a shadowy court and an imaginary authority until his death some years later meanwhile the church and the council badly needed a head although sigismund would gladly have carried all through on his sole authority but the cardinals insisted and after some disputes a new pope martin v fourteen eighteen to fourteen twenty five was chosen from the important roman family of the colonna thus ended the schism and a temporary reaction in favour of church authority and papal power began for the council had chosen a man who would never submit to control and who meant to make his position one of real weight and importance as milman says in creating a pope of high character it had given itself a master it might dictate to a john the twenty third it must submit to a martin the fifth the council of constance had achieved little of its great designs there were many reasons for this failure one great difficulty in the way of reform had been the danger of making any changes whilst the church was still without a head the great strength of the papacy lay in its continuity there had been an unbroken line of popes claiming to be successors of st peter according to tradition the first bishop of rome the moderate party hesitated to take any steps which might weaken this claim and so endanger the longed-for unity of the church another obstacle to counsellor action was the difficulty of finding any policy to suit the different nations whose interests were involved political questions were inevitably bound up with religious and the representatives of the various states could not agree on a common scheme of reform the efforts of the council had for the time brought peace to the church but only by the re-establishment of papal despotism the new pope was not a really great personality he did not seize the unrivalled opportunity for placing himself at the head of a church reformed united and spiritualized nevertheless he was a wise level-headed statesman he knew how to recover much of the papal authority lost in previous years and to obtain control over the national churches which had been struggling toward independence his period of rule was largely occupied with re-establishing himself in italy which was a scene of the wildest confusion the duke of milan was warring in lombardy in naples under joanna the second the question of succession was giving rise to endless struggle condottieri generals were fighting for one side or the other and also for themselves braccio and sforza being the most important the pope had a conference with braccio at florence and it was there that he was rendered furious by the popular feeling which expressed itself in a common street song braccio the great conquers every state poor pope martin is not worth a farthing the despised pope however soon made himself respected he re-established himself in rome and restored order in the turbulent city he recovered the states of the church and made his power felt in outlying countries even in england where he appointed cardinal beaufort his legate and exercised more authority than any pope had done since innocent the third at home his chief efforts were directed toward reforming the body of cardinals and reducing their power and in this he had some success but there were disorders in christendom especially the hussite war in bohemia which remained a dangerous problem and martin summoned a council to meet at basel to consider this and other questions his death however prevented his participation in this great assembly and his successor eugenius the fourth was left to cope with the difficulties of the situation fourteen thirty one to fourteen forty seven the emperor sigismund had not been quietly residing at constance during the whole long period of the council his restless spirit desired fresh fields in which to expend his energy 
and when benedict the thirteenth proved too obstinate and was supported by the states of spain and portugal sigismund set out to try the effects of imperial authority on these opponents of unity always short of money the emperor sold brandenburg to frederick the first of the famous hohenzollern margraves confirmed swiss conquests in return for supplies and set out for spain where after long negotiations he did succeed in procuring the submission of aragon castile and navarre followed shortly after by that of portugal which completed the union of the west his return journey took him through france where he hoped to pose as mediator in the great quarrel with england which had just come to a head in the battle of agincourt while in paris he was led to a display of authority which infuriated the french and forms a good illustration of his views as to imperial supremacy invited as an honoured guest to watch proceedings in the parliament of paris the great french law court a case came up in which one party was unable to be heard because unequal in rank to his adversary sigismund at once knighted the petitioner as though he were the sovereign and overlord of the country france was indignant but england to which the emperor next proceeded took steps to prevent such an exercise of sovereign rights showing that any claims of imperial overlordship were totally out of date by this time if indeed the english would ever have admitted them before sigismund might put foot on english soil humphrey of gloucester younger brother of the king rode into the sea sword in hand and demanded a promise that he would perform no act of sovereignty whilst in the kingdom the promise given the guest was received with the greatest pomp and ceremony magnificently lodged in the palace of westminster and only departed after a six months visit and amid signs of the greatest affection from henry v but although it is said that the two monarchs could scarcely tear themselves from each other's arms when farewell was said the english king had not ceased his preparations for the french war and the emperor did not succeed in effecting the peace of christendom at home once more sigismund found himself surrounded by difficulties the very extent of his territories meant numerous enemies and want of money was a constant drawback the story goes that on one occasion he left his dirty linen in pledge being totally unable to pay the bill for his night's lodging his were not qualities such as fitted him for a position of such danger in which tact as well as strength was necessary sigismund was in many ways a very attractive personality tall and handsome with fair hair and blue eyes he was extremely well educated and could discourse easily in czech latin german french and italian although he never forgot his imperial dignity he knew how to be familiar and courteous was a very good talker and prompted repartee unfortunately he had external qualities rather than solid virtues he was lacking in real strength and perseverance and above all in stability his word could not be trusted and little respect could be accorded to a man who could forget his promises and break his alliances he would have made a very good show king but he lived at a time when burning questions needed solution and when ceremonies and ambitious projects could not take the place of steady purpose and real hard work the greatest danger left by the council to sigismund and germany was the hussite war fourteen nineteen to fourteen thirty one the martyrdom of huss and jerome had inflamed not discouraged the reforming party in bohemia and in fourteen nineteen open warfare broke out in prague one of the demands of the bohemian reformers was the administration of the communion in both kinds from which they obtained the name of utraquists the beginnings of revolt were caused when a procession headed by a priest bearing the chalice had stones flung at it from a window of the town hall whither the utraquists had repaired to demand the release of some of their numbers the cup was knocked from the priest's hands and the mob roused to sudden fury poured into the house slew the burgomaster and flung all the magistrates from the window on to the weapons of those below the news of this disturbance was too much for king wenzel weakened as he was by a life of self-indulgence he was struck with apoplexy and died on the spot with a great shout and roar as of a lion 1419 end of 
section fifteen section sixteen of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eight empire and papacy fourteen fourteen to fourteen fifty three part two sigismund was now king of bohemia but busy in protecting hungary against the turks he took no decided steps at once to quell the bohemian disturbance and hoped to smooth matters over by negotiation perhaps had the rebels been merely disciples of the moderate teaching of hus this would have been possible but a far more violent party had gradually been forming known as the taborites these had been organized in large open-air meetings and were anxious to break loose from all authority both of church and empire two bohemian nobles headed this party both of great zeal and ability nicholas of Husines, a man of practical wisdom and foresight and the one-eyed ziska a general and tactician of extraordinary merit the war became a mixture of religious and political struggle for besides taking up arms to defend their faith the bohemians were also fighting for their nationality against sigismund whom they would not recognize as their king the long struggle which now began in real earnest falls roughly into three divisions at first the war was defensive the hussites were infuriated and united by the measures taken against them by the crusades as they were called which were arranged by the pope and sigismund and by the fact that a german army was sent to put them down thereby inflaming their national ardour and lending vigour and purpose to their resistance later from fourteen twenty seven onwards the war became offensive on their side to hold their own it was necessary to weaken their adversaries by carrying war into the enemy's country and the terror of their arms extended into saxony silesia austria and even further finally the divisions which from the first threatened to disunite the bohemian party became more and more numerous and accentuated and the struggle degenerated into a civil strife between moderates and extremists which eventually enabled the emperor to re-establish his authority and bring the war practically to a close the programme of the hussites formulated in fourteen twenty and recognised as a sort of creed for the whole party was known as the four articles of prague these demanded complete liberty of preaching communion in both kinds for laymen as well as priests the exclusion of the clergy from temporal power and undue wealth and the immediate repression of open sins for commission of which the clergy should be liable to secular penalties this was the confession of faith put forward by the moderate party utraquists or proggers as they came to be called the taborites went much further and had more social and political aims some amongst them advocated a regular communistic system in which there should be no private property but goods of all sorts should be held in common with the proclamation of war against them differences were for the time forgotten in the common danger and in the strength of this united effort sigismund and the german army was driven out of bohemia by a series of glorious victories three crusades were defeated in fourteen twenty fourteen twenty one and fourteen twenty two and so great was the terror inspired by the invincible hussites that as one chronicler says the germans had such a loathing for heretics that they could not bring themselves to strike them or even to look them in the face these victories were due in great measure to the training and leadership of ziska he knew how to convert raw peasants into disciplined soldiers ready to hold their own against feudal forces he paid great attention to artillery and was one of the first generals to turn it to real account but above all he made use of the old war chariots and wagons according to a method all his own and totally baffling to the enemy 
these wagons attached by chains formed a defence on the march or a fortification for the camp or even a weapon of offence when driven at full speed amongst the ranks of the enemy or filled with stones and rolled down upon them from above the wagons used to be arranged according to letters of the alphabet and if the enemy got entangled amongst them they could never find the way out whilst the hussites knowing the key could twist through them with ease in manoeuvring and management of troops ziska's ability was astonishing especially when it is remembered that in fourteen twenty one a wound in his only sound eye rendered him totally blind he never for a moment relaxed his energetic and victorious career but was carried into the battle on one of his celebrated wagons in one way indeed this misfortune of their leader by helping to put more responsibility on the officers who carried out his commands trained them all the more fully in the art of war ziska unfortunately was more of a general than a statesman and his violent zeal embittered party strife and helped to prevent that complete union of the hussites which might have led to an earlier settlement of the struggle having driven sigismund from the country bohemia was at first organized under a temporary government and began to look about for a new king the crown was offered to ladislas of poland and though he refused it he sent his nephew korebut to assist the rebels and he was received in prague as ruler of the land his position was however a difficult one for Ziska and the Taborites were not really favourable, and the idea of thus establishing a Slav monarchy failed. His withdrawal was followed by terrible internal discord. The Praguers were anxious to make some sort of a compromise, and recalled Korobut, who had schemes of putting himself at the head of the moderate party, and effecting a union with the church the taborites were furious at the idea of making any concession and the year fourteen twenty four is known as ziska's bloody year for he turned his forces against the moderate party and wrought terrible havoc in the land his death from plague in the same year did nothing to quiet these dissensions but only added to divisions by splitting up the taborite party his special followers orphans they were called to typify their grief at his loss chiefly a social and political party did not disagree with the extreme taborites a religious section who denied transubstantiation and all church control these divisions were not yet however sufficient to hinder hussite success a new leader appeared procup the great a priest who never himself wielded a weapon but who was well able to lead his troops to victory and to enforce discipline and obedience he was of middle height strongly built with a very sunburnt face large eyes and fiery aspect to his skill as a general he added much theological knowledge and an eloquent tongue which he used to good purpose later at the council of basel for the present however war was his trade and he began his career with great success in saxony which opened the period of offensive warfare he also routed the new crusading army led against the bohemians by cardinal beaufort who in vain tried to rally his panic-stricken troops tearing the imperial standard to pieces in his indignation at their cowardice a further victory at taos in fourteen thirty one completely overpowered the fifth crusade and ended the last effort to put down the intrepid hussites by force of arms the only hope now was to settle the dispute by counsel it will be remembered that martin v just before his death had arranged for the meeting of a great church council at basel and cardinal cesarini had been appointed to preside fourteen thirty one to fourteen forty nine the council had a difficult opening for the new pope eugenius the fourth tried to dissolve it it was only after much controversy and great firmness on the part of the leaders of the assembly that his opposition was withdrawn and to this he was forced because of the dangers which surrounded him in italy which made him fear to arouse further enmity the council was deliberating whilst the pope was escaping from a roman revolt fourteen thirty one this he did by the aid of a pirate who took him down the tiber in a crazy old boat eugenius lay at the bottom of this covered by a shield 
while the populace ran along the bank hurling stones and shooting arrows by daring and good luck the pirate succeeded in bringing his valuable cargo safely to a larger vessel and the pope at last found shelter and respect in the city of florence the first act of the council of basel was to invite the bohemians to send a deputation to endeavour to arrange terms in january fourteen thirty two seven nobles and eight priests headed by procup the great and preceded by a banner with the motto truth conquers all entered the city whilst the populace flocked to gaze upon the little troop and their escort of horsemen with their strange dress and fierce faces the conference was conducted with great moderation and considerable ability on both sides and when argument threatened to become bitter cesarini knew how to pacify the disputants with extraordinary tact and wisdom after long and difficult consultation a basis of compromise was agreed upon and at prague compacts were drawn up and accepted by the moderate party in bohemia fourteen thirty three liberty of preaching was permitted so long as it did not exceed what ecclesiastical superiors approved communion in both kinds was allowed to those who demanded it crimes were to be punished according to the law of god and the institutes of the fathers but the clergy were not to be excluded from the possession of property unfortunately this agreement did not meet with the approval of the more extreme party in bohemia and procup at the head of taborites and orphans took up arms against the moderates at lipan fourteen thirty four a terrible battle was fought between fellow countrymen which raged a whole day and a whole night procup and his men refused to surrender and were cut down in tremendous numbers the result was a victory for the party of conciliation and a step toward the final settlement there were not only religious but also political difficulties to be overcome and it was not until fourteen thirty six that sigismund was able to enter prague and formally assume the bohemian crown the keys and seal of the town were given into his hands and he on his side delivered to the magistrates a document confirming all the old privileges and rights of the city sigismund had now obtained all his crowns before attending the basel council he had wished to add to his dignity by receiving formal coronation in italy and had set out in fourteen thirty one from milan to acquire the iron crown of lombardy this he did but the duke of milan at that time filippo maria visconti either from fear or jealousy would not be present at the ceremony excusing himself on the absurd plea that if he saw sigismund his joy would kill him the emperor was not on good terms with the pope since he was strongly in favour of the council which eugenius was endeavouring to dissolve in the end however they waived their differences and sigismund came to rome to receive the imperial crown his commanding figure smiling face and flowing beard were much admired by the italians and the ceremony was successfully accomplished on the head of the emperor was first placed a bishop's mitre then the golden crown and whilst he held the imperial sword eugenius bore the crucifix they left the church together sigismund leading the papal mule for a few paces before mounting his own more martial steed the bohemian crown the last which sigismund acquired was not altogether a peaceful possession for though open war was ended troubles and dissensions were to continue for many a long day and plots were formed against the new monarch which were encouraged by his own wife sigismund however was not long to enjoy triumphs or to struggle with dangers his death is curiously characteristic a display of very real courage employed for dramatic effect feeling his end draw near he first attended mass robed and crowned in all his imperial splendour and when that was over grave clothes were placed above his grand vestments and thus arrayed he awaited death seated on his throne where on the evening of the same day he passed away ninth of december fourteen thirty seven for three days his corpse was left seated according to his command that men might see that the lord of all the world was dead and gone 
although it is impossible to avoid smiling at the almost childish vanity of sigismund and his striving after effect it is nevertheless true that his aims were high his schemes of peace reformation and unity noble and desirable only he was too impatient and too changeable to carry through any concerted plan his worst fault however was lack of truthfulness his word could not be relied upon and no good intentions could atone for such extreme untrustworthiness all this time the council of basel was continuing its sessions and more and more inclining toward attacks upon the papal authority despite the effects of cesarini to modify its violence it was no wonder that eugenius was ready to take the first opportunity to assert his independence an occasion presented itself in connection with the negotiations now open with the greeks john the sixth head of the eastern empire established at constantinople was in a very dangerous position owing to the inroads of the turks who were getting nearer and nearer to his capital city and his one hope lay in assistance from western europe it had long been the cherished wish of the papacy to establish a union between the eastern and western churches which had only come together very temporarily in the time of gregory the tenth and john in his great need for help contemplated a sacrifice of greek independence in return for active support eugenius keenly anxious to win honour as negotiator of so great a matter urged that the council should transfer itself to italy as more convenient for the greek envoys and when the basil assembly refused this proposal he summoned a council of his own at ferrara to discuss the important business fourteen thirty eight the eastern emperor himself and the patriarch of constantinople as head of the greek church came in person to the conference with twenty-two bishops they landed in venice where the doge received them with the greatest magnificence his vessel adorned with scarlet and gold and golden lions on the prow at ferrara eugenius met them and considerable difficulty was caused over the exact ceremonial details which were to be observed the patriarch for example was furious at the idea of kissing the pope's foot and after a whole day had been wasted in discussing this vital question he was let off with a salutation on the papal cheek even this had to be done privately that none might be surprised another great difficulty was the arrangement of seats at the council it had been suggested that the greeks and latins should occupy opposite sides and the pope should be enthroned as a link between the two this again offended the susceptible embassage and in the end the greek emperor was given a throne facing that of the pope with the patriarch behind him this did not satisfy the patriarch for he was not allowed to adorn his seat with curtains as he wished in order that it might resemble the papal throne at last all was set in order and the conference began there were really no great points of doctrine in dispute between the two churches but long hours of discussion were spent over small details and verbal differences the real difficulty was that the eastern church was unwilling to submit to the papal supremacy and it was only with the most extreme reluctance that this at last was done as the only chance of help in the immediate emergency the council had been transferred to florence and there in fourteen thirty nine the greeks accepted terms of union and the emperor consented to admit we recognize the pope as sovereign pontiff vice-regent and vicar of christ shepherd and teacher of all christians ruler of the church of god saving the privileges and rights of the patriarchs of the east fourteen thirty nine the pacification was little more than nominal the greeks at home were furious at the terms no great european force was raised to oppose the turks and no permanent results seemed to follow the union for eugenius however the council of florence had been extremely advantageous he won much prestige as the creator of unity in christendom and this had been done in an italian council completely under his authority the council of basel had no corresponding successes to show for its work and was stirred to fresh measures of independence in fourteen thirty nine its members went so far as to depose eugenius 
and to start another schism by electing a pope of their own it was necessary to choose some one with money and they turned to amadeus duke of savoy a widower with several children and great political influence his wife had been a daughter of philip the bold of burgundy and his daughters had been married to the duke of milan and the duke of anjou of late years however he had withdrawn into religious seclusion and though still a layman founded a sort of order adopting a grey monkish cloak and a gold cross a writer of the time thinks that there was quite as much luxury as religion in his comfortable hermitage amadeus accepted the offers of the council and took the name of felix v in fourteen thirty nine but begged that he might be allowed to keep his beard this he was eventually induced to sacrifice as it gave him so strange an appearance amongst all the clean-shaven priests and cardinals to meet this difficulty eugenius felt that he must win the active support of germany and the emperor sigismund's death had ended the male line of the great house of luxembourg in accordance with his wishes the electors chose as his successor albert of austria the representative of the famous house of habsburg fourteen thirty eight to fourteen forty so long excluded from the imperial dignity albert was a ruler of great promise but unfortunately he barely survived his election two years his death cleared the way for a very inferior successor frederick the third fourteen forty to fourteen ninety three the cousin of the dead monarch belonged to the younger branch of the habsburg family and was a young man of an easy-going temper which did not lead him to take a very decided policy one way or the other perhaps his inactivity was not altogether due to indolence he was by no means lacking in brains and sometimes found that to do nothing was the best way of avoiding difficulties the pope had a very able envoy to arrange terms of friendship with germany aeneas silvius piccolomini who was to play a most important part in later history had already distinguished himself at basel and elsewhere he came from a family noble though poor and had been well educated at siena he obtained work as secretary for various churchmen whom he accompanied to the council of basel and his ability and extraordinary powers of persuasion led to his being employed on important embassies he had also literary distinctions was crowned with the laurel wreath as imperial poet and is the author of a vivid account of the great events in which he took part owing largely to his tact and exertions germany was restored to obedience just before the death of eugenius the fourth in fourteen forty seven and this alliance was confirmed and strengthened by the succeeding pope nicholas v fourteen forty seven to fourteen fifty five who was able to arrange terms almost wholly to the advantage of the papacy nicholas was a very able man who did much to restore papal prestige although his outward appearance was anything but impressive he was small and insignificant with weak legs a harsh voice and a very pale face disfigured by protruding lips only his large black eyes expressed something of his commanding intellect his concordant with the emperor gave the final blow to the feeble existence of the council of basel fourteen forty nine felix v who had gained little by his empty and expensive title was readily transformed once more into amadeus of savoy and the council was quietly dissolved having first secured its dignity by electing nicholas as pope in fourteen fifty a magnificent jubilee at rome was the outward and visible sign of the renewed power of the roman pontiff a further triumph for nicholas was the arrival of frederick the third in rome for coronation at his hands fourteen fifty two formerly writes aeneas silvius the imperial authority surpassed all to-day that of the pope is by far the greater the ceremony was one of great magnificence but for frederick it was quite an unprofitable triumph he spent a very pleasant time in italy wandered happily about rome to enjoy the sights and bought various articles of luxury in the shops of venice but he had no solid result to show here then we must leave pope and emperor 
the empire had been steadily declining not only were ideas of universal rule abandoned and italy practically independent but the disunion of germany was a great source of weakness outlying possessions had been gradually lost france had been extending her eastern frontier burgundy in the hands of an important french family was becoming very independent and now the turks were threatening great danger in the east frederick the third was not a man to conquer difficulties but he is important in german history nevertheless because of his consolidation of habsburg territories from this time onward with one short exception the imperial office remained in the hands of this family until the empire fell before napoleon i even now the habsburg house rules over the present empire of austria nicholas v on the other hand seemed to have restored the papacy to something of its old dignity the attempts to rule the church by councils independent of and superior to the pope had failed basel was the last general council ever held of the undivided western church the popes were strong and attempted for a time to pose as the leaders of learning and the heads of the coming renaissance but this victory was less complete than it appeared at the time the councillor movement had failed not so much because of papal power as because of the development of national churches it was this which had rendered it impossible to arrive at any satisfactory solution at constance as well as at basel it was impossible to make arrangements for the whole of christendom when the church in england in france and in germany each had its own ideas as to what was best and each wished to maintain its own rights and independence thus the apparent reaction in favour of orthodoxy and papal authority was soon to give way before national opposition and the growing desire for reform and liberty of thought in fourteen fifty three the protestant revolution was very close at hand End of section 16. Section 17 of the End of the Middle Age, 1273 to 1453 by Eleanor Constance Lodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9. Italy, 1382 to 1453, Part 1 the history of italy at the close of the fourteenth and during the fifteenth centuries presents the same complications and difficulties as before it is still the history of divided states struggling for their own advancement and yet the feuds and friendships of state with state renders it impossible to study one without the others or to regard them as completely separate entities a few general lines may perhaps be laid down to explain in some degree the course of events and to act as guiding threads through the maze of italian politics the popes had now returned to the states of the church but with their authority considerably reduced by absence and in constant difficulty with their roman subjects at home whilst anti-popes and the claims of the great councils were occupying them abroad thus the pope was ready to side with any faction in italy which would repudiate his rival or help him to assert his temporal power to which he more particularly devoted his energies milan until fourteen forty seven was in the powerful hands of the visconti who had established so formidable a duchy in lombardy that they might aspire with some hope of success to rule over all northern italy here we read of extraordinary cunning and cruelty in member after member of this hated family of intrigues with other cities of absorption of smaller towns the leading motive throughout being desire for territorial aggrandizement and fear of any other state growing in power above all venice the only dangerous rival to their dominion in the north venice was now becoming more and more of an italian power owing to the growth of her territory on the mainland which brought her into rivalry with milan and also florence each state being bitterly jealous of the other genoa 
the old rival of venice could never really equal her in commerce after the war of chioggia though her jealousy still glowed hotly she was in subjection for the most part either to france or to milan who competed with her for supremacy and against whom she struggled with occasional success in fourteen eleven she had freed herself from french rule only to acknowledge the supremacy of milan from the latter she obtained liberty for a short period in fourteen thirty five of all these states florence had perhaps the most important history but it was a history of gradual subjection and loss of liberty at the close of the fourteenth century the struggle between the lower and upper classes ended in the complete victory of an oligarchy under the albizzi which led in its turn to the more valid though more despotic authority of the medici family won for it in our period by the celebrated cosimo the external relations of florence were chiefly determined by the desire for expansion and by jealousy of venice and milan under cosimo de medici a sort of balance of power policy was adopted which enabled florence to more than hold her own in the struggle for wealth and importance another feature peculiarly characteristic of italian history was the influence and power of the great condottieri such generals as braccio sforza piccinino were fully as important as dukes of milan or kings of naples all sides fought with paid armies and success depended on ability to pay these troops and on the good understanding which could be established with their leaders these chiefs had become more than mere commanders of great companies in many cases they were rewarded with castles and lands became great feudal lords and competed for power with the old territorial princes the way in which the condottieri fought first for one party then for another adds a further complication to the study of this perplexing but fascinating period events in naples have been alluded to from time to time in connection with other matters but for the sake of clearness it may be useful to repeat them shortly in one consecutive narrative charles the third thirteen eighty two to thirteen eighty six it will be remembered had succeeded in establishing himself on the throne of naples and had put to death queen joanna i whose adopted heir louis of anjou had failed to enforce his claims charles not content with one kingdom turned his ambitions to hungary where the elder branch of his house had held sway the death of louis the great left the land to his daughter maria who was betrothed to sigismund younger brother of the emperor wenzel the queen dowager elizabeth was regent a party of hungarian barons discontented with this arrangement offered the throne to charles he hastened to hungary and was actually crowned apparently with the consent of elizabeth and her daughter who attended the ceremony but showed signs of extreme grief and wept bitterly despite the kind treatment which they received from the new king they never really abandoned their claims and elizabeth contrived the murder of the unsuspecting monarch thirteen eighty six the assassination of charles left the throne of naples once more a prey to the struggles of rival claimants ladislas son of the late king was eventually successful in holding his own against a second louis of anjou thirteen eighty six to fourteen fourteen but the claims of the latter were not renounced and remained a weapon ready to the hand of any one who wished to oppose the young neapolitan ladislas was a man certain to have enemies brave energetic and spirited he had the most soaring ambition which carried his wishes beyond italy to the very imperial crown itself his banners flaunted the proud device out kaiser out nihil as a step in his desired career of aggrandizement he seized the states of the church nominally as the friend of the pope the city of florence determined to oppose him and once more turned to the angevin candidate who was proclaimed king by the council of pisa and came in person to maintain his rights despite a complete victory at rocca secca fourteen eleven 
Louis of Anjou, owing to delay in following up his success, gained nothing from the battle. Ladislas himself said, The first day after my defeat, my kingdom and my person were both in the power of the enemy. The second day, my person was safe, but they could still, if they wished, have become masters of my kingdom. The third day, all fruit of the victory was lost. There was no more trouble from this quarter, and not many years later, Louis died at Rome. Ladislas himself had but three more years to live, years chiefly occupied in quarrels with John the Twenty-Third, who was driven from Rome. His death in 1414 was followed by the expulsion of all Neapolitans from the papal capital. Competition now took a new form. There were rivals, not for the throne, but for the hand of the queen. Joanna II, sister of Ladislas, though far from being an attractive character, had no lack of suitors. The Count of La Marche was eventually accepted in the hope of conciliating France, but the marriage was a failure from every point of view, and after long quarrels, ending in her husband's flight, Joanna reigned alone, 1414-1435. The third Louis of Anjou, now came forward with his claims in 1420 and was privately egged on by Pope Martin V. He soon found, however, that more than the queen were against him. Joanna had no children, and indignant at Louis being forced upon her as her successor, determined to bring a new actor on the scene in the person of Alfonso V, King of Aragon and Sicily. She adopted him as her heir, and he was only too eager to acquiesce in a plan which would once more unite the two Sicilies. Thus a long rivalry began between Angevin and Aragonese. Joanna soon repented of her choice, as Alfonso was in every way too masterful. She revoked her adoption, and making Louis of Anjou, Duke of Calabria, proclaimed him as her heir. He was a quiet and easy-going prince who went to Calabria as he was ordered and died there just before his adopted mother. Joanna had still time for another adoption, and chose, last of all, René of Provence, a younger brother of Louis, well known to us as father of Margaret of Anjou, wife of our own Henry VI, 1434. A year later the queen herself departed this life and left her two adopted sons to dispute the succession. Alfonso was captured in the struggle and carried off as prisoner to Milan. But here his attractive personality won over the Duke Filippo Visconti, who set him free and gave him help to continue the war. Poor help, as we now know, since he was at the moment secretly assisting the other side, for it suited him well to have his neighbors flying at each other's throats and providing occupation for the dangerous condottieri. The long struggle ended at last in the establishment on the throne of Alfonso, 1435 to 1458, a man of considerable ability as well as of a generosity so universal as to win him the title of magnanimous, and for a short time, Naples and Sicily were united under the same ruler. René could never be king, but Eugenius IV gave him a grand coronation, which possibly did something to atone for his disappointment. The two Sicilies were still being happily and quietly governed by Alfonso in 1453. One result of the expedition made to Italy by the emperor Henry VII is not likely to be forgotten. In 1312, he appointed Matteo Visconti imperial vicar in the city of Milan, and so established the ascendancy of that dynasty, whose name was to become the most feared and most hated in northern Italy. Under the descendants of Matteo, Milanese rule began to grow apace. In 1339, Bergamo, Brescia, Cremona, Lodi, Piacenza, Vercelli and Novara owed her sway. Parma, Tortona, Alessandria, and Asti were added a few years later, and Giovanni Visconti, the warlike Archbishop of Milan, 
overstepped the borders of lombardy by forcing the cession of bologna in 1350 and the submission of genoa in 1353 milan had become the greatest power in lombardy had alarmed florence and the other tuscan cities and excited the hostility of the pope by attacks on the states of the church in thirteen fifty four the death of the archbishop had left these extensive domains to be divided between three of his nephews matteo bernabo and galeazzo visconti matteo however was soon got out of the way by his brothers who were utterly unscrupulous and his death was greeted with pleasure by the milanese who had already learned enough of his vicious character they had gained little in bernabo and galeazzo thirteen fifty five to thirteen seventy eight all the worst features of the visconti were displayed the history of this family is almost unbelievable it is hard to realize that such monsters can ever have existed or have been allowed to live one after another showed the same extraordinary combination of crafty ability unflinching determination a cold-blooded cruelty which defies description coupled with the most despicable personal cowardice it was not till a little later in john galeazzo that we find these characteristics in their most exaggerated form but bernabo and galeazzo were unmistakable visconti it was they who issued the appalling decree which sentenced criminals to forty days torture before their execution it was bernabo who flung a peasant to his hounds for having killed a hare and forced a papal messenger to eat in his presence the parchment cord and leaden seal of the bull of excommunication which he had brought it was bernabo again who fell into such abject terror when the plague was in his capital that he hid in a house in the forest saw no one and surrounded it with a barricade to pass which entailed instant death this tyrannous coward soon reaped the reward of his crimes in thirteen seventy eight his brother died leaving his share of milanese territory to his son john galeazzo thirteen seventy eight to fourteen o two the ablest and the wickedest of this able and wicked stock the new ruler did not strike at once on the contrary he feigned a humility and a piety which completely misled his uncle and then invited him to meet him on his way to a place of pilgrimage thirteen eighty five bernabo came all unsuspecting only to be seized flung into prison despite his entreaties and promptly poisoned john galeazzo now the head of an undivided dominion threw off the mask boldly grasped at power and entered on a career which brought terror to all other italian rulers established the supremacy of milan and reduced his own subjects to a dull despair which robbed them of all power to resist the oppression cruelty and terror under which they groaned the ambition of the new tyrant was to found a kingdom of northern italy and he all but achieved his aim many territories had been recently lost and these he set to work to win back with additions the conquest of verona and the destruction of the family of della scala opened the way both to padua and venice fearing for themselves and mindful of their old quarrel with the house of carrara in padua the venetians helped milan for the time and padua was forced to surrender supreme in lombardy john galeazzo now threatened tuscany took possession of pisa siena and perugia and in thirteen ninety five forced wenzel king of the romans to confer milan and his other possessions upon him as an hereditary duchy never was the rise of any family so rapid and apparently so secure as that of the visconti wealth and power cover a multitude of sins and foreign courts were not ashamed to form marriage alliances with this race of blood-stained tyrants a daughter of bernabo had been married to leopold of habsburg the leopold who fell later on the field of zempach a sister of john galeazzo to the english prince lionel duke of clarence 
and the duke himself to isabella of france a country which he again tried to conciliate later by wedding his own daughter valentine to louis of orleans the duke who was afterwards murdered the wedding feast which was given in honour of the duke of clarence has been recorded and remains as an illustration of the enormous wealth of the visconti and the lavish profusion of those days eighteen courses appeared at the magnificent banquet each course was heralded by costly presents to the wedded pair sporting dogs of all kinds with costly collars war horses royally caparisoned armour adorned with silver and gold and many ornaments and precious stones even the food was gilded and the table groaned beneath the weight of gilded stags hares pies and game of every imaginable variety to say nothing of wine fruit sweetmeats no european monarch could possibly have spent more even had he wished and one doubts if any one could have eaten so much john galeazzo suffered one reverse to his arms the history of which is full of interest after milan had annexed padua in thirteen eighty eight francesco carrara the younger who had been imprisoned at asti escaped with his wife and determined to leave no stone unturned for the recovery of his possessions they crossed the mont Cenis in snow and first sought help in vain at avignon then by ship they returned to italy but his young wife tarea ill at the time suffered such agonies from seasickness that they endeavoured again to advance by land through hostile territories they walked in hourly fear of capture with scarcely any food sleeping where they dared in the woods in barns or in ruined churches tadea supported by her husband and scarcely able to put one foot before the other they had many disappointments at pisa they hoped for shelter but the visconti's hand was there also and they could not stay though francesco did get a horse for his wife and refreshments for the journey florence received them but dared not give open help and the brave young carrara set out once more to his kinsman the duke of bavaria a journey filled with sufferings and adventures at last with a handful of men and the promise of more to follow he returned to italy and advanced on padua where the milanese had a strong garrison his numbers were too few to attack the town but francesco knew that the river was passable and the water low with a few companions they crept up the river bed scaled the wall and entered the town whilst the attention of the defenders was distracted by shouts of peasants all round who were devoted to francesco and whom he had instructed to do this in order to make the garrison believe that they were attacked by a large force the stratagem was successful and the town was captured by the heroic little band more troops from bavaria following enabled francesco to establish himself firmly in padua and to force john galeazzo to agree to terms thirteen ninety two end of section seventeen section eighteen of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter nine italy thirteen eighty two to fourteen fifty three part two despite the loss of padua the duke of milan had made extraordinary progress and when the fifteenth century began florence was engaged in a struggle with this formidable rival which threatened her very existence since she was more and more isolated and cut off from all trade communications despair and exhaustion were weakening florentine resistance when she was saved from destruction by the sudden death of her enemy from plague a comet which appeared at the time was regarded by the vainglorious duke as the signal of his end fourteen o two i thank god he said that he has given in the heavens a sign of my summons that may be known to all men the death of john galeazzo threw the duchy into anarchy and ended his schemes for the kingdom of northern italy none of his successors were equal to such a task 
the vast dominions collected with so much labour were now divided between two young sons of the dead duke while his widow catherine was regent but she speedily alienated every one by the aimless cruelties which she thought would do instead of strong rule and the condottieri more numerous and powerful than ever before took advantage of the general disorder and began to seize towns and lands for their own use filippo maria the younger son eventually established his supremacy the elder john maria whose unreasoning atrocities proclaimed him practically a madman having been murdered by the milanese nobles in fourteen twelve filippo married a woman twenty years his senior the widow of facino cane a general who had annexed certain important towns which were thus regained he discovered the merits of carmagnola a simple soldier and made him his commander-in-chief he regained milan which had been taken when his brother was murdered and restored the shattered duchy filippo maria visconti who ruled from fourteen twelve to fourteen forty seven though not without ability was a feeble copy of his father he was far weaker always suspicious and afraid of decided measures john galeazzo had been a coward he shunned arms and shrieked at a thunderstorm but no personal fear seemed to affect his purposes or awaken his conscience filippo was more of a coward all around he dared not see his soldiers he shrank from the very mention of death he was always expecting treachery and would receive no visitors part of his withdrawal from sight may have been due to his extreme ugliness which made him dislike publicity yet with all his timidity he was still a visconti in cruelty he did not hesitate to get rid of his blameless wife as soon as every advantage had been gained from the match and his people were still tortured and oppressed the chief event of the fifteenth century in north italy was the fierce struggle which raged between milan and venice venice all this while had not been idle after the war of chioggia had practically established her superiority over genoa she had been turning her attention more and more to extension on the mainland the first foe with whom she was thus brought into conflict was the lord of padua and on this account she had actually joined with john galeazzo in his attack on the cararesi and was given treviso as her share of the spoils the death of john galeazzo brought venice and the restored state of padua once more into rivalry since each coveted the same portions of the dead man's territory in this quarrel ended the life of the gallant francesco carrara whose early career we have traced carried a captive to venice he was murdered in prison defending himself to the last the fall of this family left the venetian republic master of padua vicenza verona and the surrounding districts and a most important power in northern italy new dangers followed the new acquisitions made by venice the purchase of dalmatia involved her in war with hungary the paduan territories excited the jealousy of milan for some time a war party and a peace party had been disputing in venice where in fourteen twenty three the matter was brought to a head by an appeal from florence for help against the duke of milan and a threat that failing help she would throw herself on to his side and make him king of italy at last after much hesitation the new doge francesco foscari induced the republic to declare war fourteen twenty five an alliance was formed with florence and carmagnola the famous condottieri alienated by his former master filippo of milan was placed at the head of the venetian forces this war between venice and milan was one between great condottieri opposed to carmagnola was piccinino and malatesta and most frequently sforza for he had his own game to play and changed sides when it seemed best for the success of his policy francesco sforza was one of the most striking figures of his day his father the first to take up the trade of war and found the dynasty was a peasant of cotilogna 
a man of enormous size and strength in thirteen eighty he was invited by some passing soldiers struck by his appearance to join their ranks he flung his pickaxe into an oak tree if it fell he would go on working if it stayed he would join the troop no pick returned he took to the soldier's trade and was given the nickname of sforza or the violent he became a warrior of great renown and we have already heard of him fighting in naples in the papal states and elsewhere besides acquiring territorial possessions of his own his chief source of strength lay in his army and the devotion which his followers always felt for him the manner of his death helps to explain his influence over them he lost his life fording a swift river into which he had returned to encourage his men after having already crossed in safety himself seeing a young page overpowered by the current he stooped to save him fell from his horse and utterly unable to swim in his heavy armour was swept down by the flood before any one could reach him his son francesco took command in his place and became his equal in valour and warlike fame now this younger sforza was aiming at a principality of his own and the son of a simple peasant was the recognised suitor for the hand of bianca an illegitimate daughter of filippo of milan himself at the opening of the war all went well for venice and brescia and bergamo were added to her territories but little by little the conduct of carmagnola gave rise to the suspicion that he was not doing his best that he was either secretly favouring the enemy or that at least he was prolonging the war by his inactivity as useful for his own interests the government at last could stand it no longer the general was invited to venice nominally for a consultation and after being splendidly entertained was suddenly arrested and sentenced to death by a special court fourteen thirty two other generals were soon found to take his place and with varying success the war dragged on until the death of filippo maria in fourteen forty seven made a sudden change in the whole situation for with him ended the male line of the visconti the question now arose how should milan be governed the milanese themselves proclaimed a republic but there were plenty of claimants for the duchy sforza was married to filippo's daughter and had long been planning to secure his inheritance venice would gladly have seized the opportunity of advancing at her rival's expense charles of orleans asserted his rights as son of valentine visconti and grandson of john galeazzo eventually sforza having gained the support of cosimo de medici who preferred to see him rather than venice master of milan solved the difficulty by besieging the town and the milanese divided between fear of him and hatred of venice which might have helped them surrendered to the formidable soldier and recognized him as their duke fourteen fifty the venetians had lost a great opportunity and they could do nothing against the new ruler by force of arms in fourteen fifty four the long struggle was ended by the peace of lodi which deprived venice of her latest conquests and gave her the frontier of fourteen twenty eight a few words must be said concerning the domestic history of the venetian republic during this period its chief feature was the decline of any real authority in the hands of the doge and the growing supremacy of the council of ten for some time past the ducal office had been becoming more and more an empty honour and the theory that he was the delegate of the people little but a picturesque pretence originally the people had been really consulted in the election and though this had turned into a formal sanction it was not until fourteen fourteen that the old words were omitted this is your doge and it please you and the new ruler was presented to his subjects with the bald announcement your doge the history of francesco foscari the first doge to be proclaimed in this manner illustrates clearly the real character of the office and its complete lack of authority his son jacopo suspected of taking bribes and bestowing offices was tortured and banished by the ten recalled once he was again tried again tortured and again banished 
his father refusing to interfere in his favour when the state decreed his punishment foscari worn out and broken by grief began to take less active share in public life whereupon the all-powerful ten demanded his resignation fourteen fifty seven in vain the doge pointed out that such an order could only proceed from the great council the ten remained immovable and foscati left the palace submissive to the will of the real rulers of the city so ends our period for milan and venice in the former visconti tyranny has merely given place to the despotism of the sforzas the latter has apparently come victorious out of the war with increase of territory and plenty of riches and splendour for the moment but there are rocks ahead dangers are threatening from turks on the east from italian rivals in the west and from loss of her far-famed commerce and wealth which dwindled after the discovery of a passage round the cape of good hope opened a new trade route for the vessels of europe we have seen in an earlier chapter that the government of florence at the close of the thirteenth century was very democratic largely that is in the hands of the people as time went on the upper classes became more and more dissatisfied at the limitations on their power and the wealthy burghers determined to assert their authority in thirteen seventy eight a rising of the chompi as the lowest classes of all were called gave opportunity for a reaction in the opposite direction and little by little the government fell into the hands of an oligarchy a small number of leading citizens gained possession of all the chief offices and by skilful management of the scrutinies were able to keep themselves in power until florence was far from possessing a democratic government the rule of this oligarchy was at first most successful florence held her own against milan increased her commerce and extended her territories the conquest of pisa in especial gave her access to the sea and raised hopes of naval enterprises then followed a period of discontent and failure the people excluded from power began to murmur and especially the lower middle classes who were growing in wealth and felt bitterly their exclusion from office the weight of taxation also necessary for carrying on the government was a constant source of complaint but above all the oligarchy itself began to split up into hostile family groups jealous of each other's power and intriguing for their own supremacy of these the most important were the albizzi and the medici rinaldo degli albizzi headed the narrow oligarchy which controlled the government the medici rich bankers and money changers came to be allied with the lower classes whose favour they won partly by generous expenditure of their vast wealth giovanni de medici was looked up to as popular champion against the party in power and he advocated fairer and better distributed taxation but no active steps against the oligarchy were taken during his lifetime on his deathbed he gave much good advice to his son cosimo his successor in wealth and more than his successor in power be compassionate to the poor and assist them with your alms to the rich be gracious and obliging especially if in honest adversity let your counsel be friendly not dictatorial and be not rendered arrogant by public honour or popular applause in fourteen thirty three an unsuccessful war for the conquest of lucca rendered still more unpopular the party in power and rinaldo degli albizzi feeling his authority insecure and dreading medician influence secured the arrest and banishment of cosimo and his brother lorenzo and the exclusion of the whole family from public office the tide soon turned however rinaldo was unpopular and in the following year in his turn was banished and cosimo recalled with the greatest honour and signs of rejoicing fourteen thirty four this was a great event in florentine history for it marks the foundation of medician ascendancy cosimo slowly but surely made himself the chief authority in the city although he never posed as official ruler nor did he alarm the citizens by outward pomp and ceremony he avoided offending the lower people and endeavoured as far as possible to level class distinctions and to favour no single faction in the state 
his great ability enabled him to establish a despotism which was all the stronger for being disguised and from this time the foreign and domestic policy of florence was really in his hands the rule of cosimo at home was very different from that of other italian tyrants such as the visconti in milan for example he aimed at complete power for himself and his dynasty but he achieved this by influence rather than open rule by intrigue rather than by violence and by money not by the dagger his immense wealth was a great weapon in his hands and if he wished to punish an enemy he did so by ruining him with taxes instead of by arrest torture or death his despotism on the whole was based upon popular support all this does not imply that cosimo was unselfish and scrupulous nothing was allowed to stand in his way as he said himself states are not to be preserved by paternosters but he was averse to violence and would never have desired unnecessary cruelties comine writing after his death says his authority was soft and amiable and such as is necessary for a free town in foreign affairs cosimo aimed at maintaining a balance of power at not that is allowing any italian state to advance to such an extent as to threaten the welfare of his own thus he was bound at first to adopt a policy of hostility toward milan and the ambitions of the visconti and this led to an alliance with venice although there was little love lost between florentines and venetians again when filippo maria took up the cause of alfonso in naples florence threw her weight on to the side of rene in fourteen forty seven when the duke of milan died cosimo favoured the claims of sforza and wished to break off the venetian alliance as no longer necessary but this he was unable to do openly owing to the feeling of the people until sforza's success in fourteen fifty when florence joined with milan against venice and naples although this policy thus shortly stated may seem complicated and ineffective the result in reality was to make florence a very great power in italy the ally of france and a mediator in all questions of difficulty in the peninsula at the close of our epoch cosimo de medici had still many years of life and power before him and his history belongs largely to a later period End of section eighteen section nineteen of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter ten history of france thirteen eighty to fourteen fifty three part one the period which followed the reign of charles the wise was one of great disaster for france the new king charles the sixth was only eleven years old on his father's death and though a boy of considerable spirit and promise his early introduction to the troubles excitements and dissipations of royalty were too much for a brain naturally feeble his reign began with a struggle for power amongst his uncles charles v had three brothers the duke of anjou the eldest was greedy and ambitious he stole the crown jewels and declared himself regent the duke of berry was bought off by being given the rule in languedoc where his cruelties and oppressions encouraged constant disquiet which kept him occupied philip the bold the boy who alone had stood by his father at poitiers had been rewarded with the duchy of burgundy which had fallen to the crown in thirteen sixty one and was one of the richest princes in europe he had married margaret of flanders widow of the last duke of burgundy of the old house and only child of count louis le mal who died in thirteen eighty two leaving all his great territories in the hands of his son-in-law an all-important fact for it was largely on account of flanders that burgundy became later more attached to england than to france a fourth claimant for power was found in the duke of bourbon brother of the late king's wife 
and the selfish disputes between these princes of the fleur de lys were not conducive to the welfare of the country the close of the fourteenth century was a period of popular risings in many countries it was not only in england that wat tyler's rebellion showed the strength of the people growing in opposition to feudalism in france there were disturbances in paris at the opening of the new reign chiefly against the heavy taxation of the princes the rioters were called maillotins or hammerers from the weapon they most frequently carried the government for the time had to yield to popular wishes the duke of anjou was anxious for peace as his whole attention was turned to naples on which he had claims and in thirteen eighty two his departure to fight for his rights against charles of durazzo left the chief authority in the hands of philip of burgundy urged by his uncle philip the young king went off with a large army to assist the count of flanders once more in trouble with his subjects the flemings especially those of ghent as before had risen against their unpopular ruler and were headed by philip van artevelde the son of their old leader a man equally bold and determined the rebels captured bruges where the count had a romantic escape being concealed in the bed of a poor woman whilst her house was searched by his enemies and other successes also emboldened the burgesses in their resistance van artevelde however was not a trained warrior and he was unable to maintain his forces against the french army at rosbeck the story runs that before the battle twenty ninth of november thirteen eighty two he had a vision of fire in the sky and heard sounds of war above the flemish camp which foretold the disaster that was to come the horrors of the next day are unrivalled in the annals of war and it was a ghastly introduction for the boy king to the trade of arms the one idea of the flemings was to obtain sheer solid strength and thus force a way through the line of their foes with this object they linked themselves so closely together that no enemy could possibly enter their ranks but on the other hand they themselves could scarcely strike a blow attacked on both sides at once they were pressed more and more closely together till half their numbers died not through the weapons of the french but from simple suffocation there was a mountain of slain flemings both long and high and never had one seen so great a battle and so many dead with so little spilling of blood this was because so many were stifled in the press so shed no blood philip van artevelde himself was among the slain and charles satisfied with this victory returned to his own country where his entry into paris was marked by a severe repression of all who had taken part in the recent rebellion the leaders of the maillotins were executed the office of provost of the merchants abolished and municipal liberties destroyed the first great event in the government came when the king declared that he was of age and like richard the second in england flung himself free from the control of his uncles thirteen eighty eight and began to govern with the help of old counsellors of his father marmuset the jealous nobles called them angry at the favour shown to men of lower birth than themselves the whole condition of affairs was changed however by the king's attack of madness a combination of causes helped to bring this about one of charles's most trusted advisers was his constable olivier de clisson a personal enemy of clisson pierre de caron backed up by the duke of brittany determined on his removal one night when returning with a few attendants through the narrow street of st catherine the constable was fallen upon by pierre himself and a band of hired ruffians who dealt him blows which felled him from his horse and as they thought killed him he was saved by striking in his fall the half-open door of a baker's shop where work had begun early as he fell across the threshold the assassins dared not enter the house but fled in hot haste leaving him stretched unconscious the king to whom news of the crime was brought flew half-dressed to the assistance of his friend found him alive and learnt the name of the would-be murderer medical aid was speedily procured and the constable recovered but charles having failed to capture de caron 
determined on the punishment of the duke of brittany whom he rightly guessed to have been at the bottom of the affair ill and feverish himself he disregarded the prayers of his doctors and during the hottest summer months rode to the attack of his unruly vassal one blazing july day having first been startled in a wood by a madman who had seized his bridle crying turn turn you are betrayed he was driven out of his senses by the sudden clang of a lance which a sleepy page let fall on the helmet carried by another of his attendants thinking that a whole army was upon him the king completely crazed drew his sword and fell upon his own followers striking down right and left finally he hotly pursued his own brother the duke of orleans and was only captured with great difficulty and at last quieted although unable to recognize any one the attack was violent but it passed at last only to be renewed by the wild career of gaiety with which his friends sought to dispel his melancholy humours an awful accident gave the final blow to his poor wits dressed as wild men with clothes of skin soaked in pitch he and five others were dancing at a marriage feast when the duke of orleans with a torch set fire to one of the inflammable dresses the king was saved by a lady with whom he was talking and who covered him with her robe but the other five perished in the flames which caught them all and could not be extinguished charles never recovered from this shock though only completely mad at periods of the year he was never really himself hence a struggle ensued for power in the kingdom which threw the whole working of the government out of gear and eventually left the country an easy prey to the renewed invasion of the english the chief rivals for the control of the government were the duke of burgundy whose great territorial power has already been noticed and charles's brother the duke of orleans the latter was far the inferior in actual wealth and position his lands though extensive were scattered and his purchase of luxembourg only involved him in expense and infuriated his rival but he had considerable influence and an attractive personality which won him friends despite the levity and unscrupulousness of his character handsome of a ready wit a lover of books and art a benefactor of the church always gay and affable orleans reminds one in many ways of our own duke humphrey of gloucester as was the case in the rivalry between gloucester and beaufort this quarrel meant far more than mere personal antagonism and the two principal opponents represented the two great parties into which the kingdom was divided the orleans party was that of the old feudal nobility supporters of privilege and arbitrary power while the burgundians more for the sake of opposition than from real popular leanings were champions of municipal liberty and financial reform thereby winning the allegiance of the parisians in every question that arose the two dukes took opposite sides efforts were being made at the time to end the papal schism and while burgundy was urging the retirement of pope benedict orleans was his staunchest supporter in england orleans posed as the avenger of richard the second while burgundy was making terms with the lancastrian usurper in the empire fencel was backed up by louis his rival rupert of the palatinate by philip this state of affairs was but little affected by the death in fourteen o four of philip the bold his son john the fearless took up the same attitude possibly with even greater animosity the new duke was the exact opposite of his cousin orleans short and plain built for strength rather than grace he was silent cautious unattractive and extremely ambitious a sham reconciliation between john and louis when apparently they kissed one another with tears of joy was followed almost immediately by the final tragedy in the rue des francs bourgeois in paris an inscription still marks the narrow passage below overhanging eaves where louis of orleans was murdered he had been with queen isabella of bavaria in hotel barbette when a pretended message from the king was brought to him fearing no danger he rode idly along the street swinging his glove and singing as he went 
his escort dawdling behind suddenly he was attacked and utterly defenceless could make no resistance 1407 this time there was to be no mistake the body was almost cut to pieces and a horrified woman who saw the tragedy from a neighbouring window noticed that when all was over a man with a cap pulled over his eyes came and said to the others put out your lights he is quite dead let us be off the mutilated remains were buried in a chapel which orleans himself had built amidst universal horror and mourning the coffin was borne by his uncle of berry and his cousins the titular king of sicily the duke of bourbon and the duke of burgundy all wept but none more bitterly than duke john the crime was not long a mystery burgundy acknowledged that it had been done by his command it was i the devil tempted me he whispered to the old duke of bourbon probably in a moment of repentance and humiliation but though he fled after his avowal the deed was not regarded with universal indignation orleans had long ceased to be popular with the people especially in paris and there was even a master of the university who wrote in defence of the act as the just removal of a tyrant john of burgundy soon restored to pride and self-confidence was able for some years to maintain his ascendancy and through the dauphin louis who was his son-in-law became the practical ruler of the kingdom vengeance however was only delayed not averted the three sons of the murdered man too young to take the lead themselves were joined by most of the old noble families and especially by bernard of armagnac who now became the head of the party france was divided into two camps each of which took up arms and a civil war broke out known in history as the struggle between the armagnacs and burgundians the complications of this strife of parties would take too long to unravel the results of it were seen in the great misery of paris and the country generally and in the extreme dearness of food and terrible poverty and distress above all the civil war in france was a direct cause of the new english invasion hitherto there had been little danger from england richard the second when freed from his own difficulties had made peace with france and married the princess isabel henry the fourth had had no time to spare from securing his own position but now henry v young popular and warlike was ready to reassert the old claim at a moment's notice john of burgundy for a time humbled by his rivals began to treat with the enemy of france and offered to help him in an attack upon the dominions of the armagnacs henry spent some time in negotiating but he meant war from the first and it did not require the dauphin's foolish present of tennis balls to stir up his zeal for the enterprise in august fourteen fifteen he landed in normandy with a small but well-disciplined army our fleur a sort of second calais was taken after a determined resistance and henry sent a personal challenge to the dauphin the combat to be for the crown itself although whatever the issue charles the sixth was to retain it as long as he lived but the question was not to be settled in this summary fashion the challenge was disregarded and the english army set out in the direction of calais following a route very similar to that taken by edward the third the strictest order was kept amongst the troops severe penalties being imposed on all plundering and on all deeds of violence the port was not to be reached without opposition a large force of the french three or four times equal to that of henry faced him near the castle of agincourt and a battle was inevitable the situation was one of the greatest danger but the king was cool as ever by the god of heaven by whose grace i stand and in whom i trust i would not have another man if i could wouldst thou not that the lord with these few can overthrow the pride of the french so he answered one of his followers who ventured to wish for more archers the soldiers were in sore need of encouragement they were weakened by sickness and poor food and a night of pouring rain before the battle did not contribute to their spirits the ground was not particularly in favour of the english but their small numbers were skilfully disposed in a long line all on foot even the king himself 
and the archers were protected from a cavalry attack by a row of six-foot stakes planted in front of them the french on the other hand were in three solid divisions one behind the other for the space did not permit all their numbers to commence the fight at once they had archers but these were uselessly placed behind the men-at-arms who had refused to allow them what was considered the place of honour in the front another mistake arising from the same jealous pride was that all the princes and nobles were in the first division and their followers almost leaderless in the rearguard so that no order or firmness was to be expected there add to this that the french had no real commander-in-chief and it will be evident that the success of the english was not astonishing although their courage in attacking so enormous an army is deserving of every honour the loss of life on the french side was terrible fighting in such close ranks the soldiers were scarcely able to defend themselves and when the two front divisions were pressed back the rear fled almost without striking a blow october twenty fifth fourteen fifteen henry could however do no more that campaign but taking ship at calais returned to give thanks in england for his great victory meanwhile the internal discord of france continued as before and utterly paralyzed resistance to the foreigners as a parisian writing during the siege says the nobles were far too busy to attend to the english the death of the king's two eldest sons made charles dauphin and he was completely under the control of the armagnac party whilst john the fearless had won queen isabel to his side these divisions encouraged henry backed up also by the emperor sigismund to renew the attack and war was recommenced in fourteen seventeen with the siege of rouen the garrison was starved out nineteenth of january fourteen nineteen they were reduced says a chronicler to eating dogs cats rats mice and such things so that it was piteous to behold when the attack began the poor were driven from the town to save the scanty provisions henry would not let them pass his lines but provided food for them and they lived in the dry moat whilst the siege went on babies were drawn up in baskets to be baptized and then let down again and on christmas day a dinner was provided for them by the english king in honour of the festival nevertheless despite his kindness of heart henry did not make war as though it were a tournament or knightly exercise he made stiff terms with the conquered and would listen to no plans for peace which did not give him all that edward the third had gained at bretigny with normandy in addition negotiations seemed to be falling through when an event occurred which practically threw france into the hands of the english after many efforts peace at last seemed possible between burgundians and armagnacs and the duke of burgundy though not without hesitation consented to a meeting with the dauphin tanaghi du chatel now the practical leader of the armagnac party himself silenced his fears my honoured lord have no doubts monsieur is well pleased with you and wishes in future to govern as you wish and besides you have good friends near him who love you we trust in your word replied the duke but see well that what you say is true for you will do ill to betray us i would rather die than betray you or any one swore the false tanguy and together they rode to the meeting-place on a bridge at montereau barricades had been erected and the two principals entered accompanied by a few followers john the fearless knelt to the dauphin and in this position unable to draw his sword he was struck down by a gang of men who rushed up from behind the prince but tanguy himself is said to have dealt the first blow tenth of september fourteen nineteen the murder was disastrous for the country more than a century later a monk showing francis i the great dent made by a blow in the skull of john the fearless said sire that is the hole through which the english entered france john's son philip now duke of burgundy who thought of nothing but how to avenge his father was ready to make any terms with the english and by his assistance the treaty of troyes was drawn up the terms of which would debar the family of his father's murderer for ever from the succession 
1420. Charles VI was to be left in possession of the kingdom for his life, but Henry was to be regent, was to marry the Princess Catherine, and to succeed when the king died. This seemed strange to some in France, a chronicler quaintly remarks, but nothing else could be done for the present. With characteristic energy the English king allowed himself one day only for his marriage festivities, and when urged to hold a great tournament on the morrow, replied, Next morning we must be ready to besiege the castle of Saint, where we shall find the enemies of our lord the king, and there can each of us joust and tourney and display his prowess and hardihood. End of section 19